welcome back to the Intelligent Conversations podcast. Today, I have the honor to speak with Dr. Douglas Garland. Douglas has practiced orthopedic surgery for 37 years in Southern California. He's been studying the tall poppy phenomenon for over 10 years after he experienced it firsthand. So Douglas, thank you for coming on. I think this is a very interesting topic. We mentioned that kind of beforehand. But before we kind of get into that, I want to kind of get an idea of like, where, how did you kind of go down that pathway of, you know, becoming a doctor, orthopedic surgery? Like, what kind of was your interest in going down that road? Well, there was no interest in it, actually. It's, I have a very, everybody has a story. So my real story, I think, is how I grew up and everything. But the the story then became late in my career with the tall poppy syndrome. I grew up in a small farm town in central Iowa, a town of 400 people, very Irish Catholic family and religion and home and family and America were all very important. My dad was a World War II vet. And there were seven kids. And I can tell you the thing that we're going to discuss was very prevalent in our family. As seven kids, my parents tried to keep each of us equal. And they, we only would have a birthday once we were 10 years old, for example, our 10th year. And of course, the amount spent and the type of birthday party pretty much stayed the same through all seven kids. And actually, as I went home, one time I was home during my medical school years and I found my mother's black book, which was she kept track of all the money that she spent on us for our college education. And I mean, the whole idea, I know what she was doing was trying to keep everybody the same and and not favor one over the other. So that, that's an example, sort of in a way, of the tall poppy syndrome, which would become a big part of my life. But anyway, the, the township too, which are is typical of a Midwest township, small town, very Scandinavian, uh, all, you know, on one, one town might be German, and the next one might be uh, the, all Norwegians. And and those cultures, uh, the small town tries to keep everybody equal, too. They they want to um, kind of cut you down if you, they call it back then, too big for your britches. But the whole township uh, tried to keep everybody corner, kind of on the same path. They wanted good for everybody, uh, but they didn't tolerate smart alecks. And so I grew up in in that culture, but didn't think anything about it. And a lot of people do, and just like America doesn't know about it. That's very pervasive in most families and in most societies. My dad's thing was we were the first kids to, we were about five generations of farmers, and my mother's family was went further back than that. And my father was just like everybody else. This is in the 50s, and the space race was starting up, and and the Cold War, and we had to get ahead. And I mean, there was a big national push. I mean, really, sciences were very important in school. And so my dad, who ran a grain elevator, actually, which was in the family, his father ran the grain elevator. Uh, You know, you have to get ahead, you have to go to college. So I, I went to college, really, without any direction, but just because my father said I had to get ahead. And, and then it was in college. I, it was a Jesuit school, and and I was a my sophomore year. I was a dorm advisor, meaning that I got paid to help the freshman class. I stayed in the same dorm that I was the previous year. And one day, the Jesuit priest who ran the dorm called me in his office and asked me if I ever thought about becoming a physician, was which was the furthest thing from my mind. All that extra education and money and things. And I told him no, and I didn't think I was interested, but he said, well, you should consider it. You'll be a good physician. And that was one of those fortunate aha moments I had very early in life. And from that moment on, uh, I mean, it really changed my life. I went from not really knowing who I was or what I wanted to do to become very focused on studying hard to get into medical school getting into medical school, working hard, uh, getting my residency and my practice. I uh, ended up in L.A. in one of the premier practices and 
and at USC Medical School, where I eventually became a full professor of orthopedics and published over 120 scientific articles. So uh, going from a small town to one of the largest in the country and becoming a professor and a pseudoscientist uh, is kind of a nice journey. But there, the important thing is the, the family and the concept and no divorce and good parents. And there's a thing called ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences, where if you have uh, divorce, alcohol, crime, unwanted pregnancies, criminal record. If you have any of those in your family, those are negative. I had none. I'm zero. So you, you, I have to be thankful for a wonderful family. And the other thing, which I did up subconsciously and didn't appreciate, I took advantage of good, good envy. Envy, when psychologists look at emotions, um, the emotions are just a functional state. That's where you are at that particular moment at time. Just uh, I'm looking at you, evaluating how young mm -hmm. and handsome you are, and and <laughs> nice Thank hair you. and all those things. And and I'm old and wrinkled and no hair. So you know you're still look good though. The, the, thank you. The envy emotion is always on. You're always comparing. That's what the internet is all about. Don't forget. That's the big envy machine. So good envy is you look at somebody and it's good coveting by looking at uh, your neighborhood and a good house and a nicely manicured house. Then you want to you want to envy that and have uh, good neighborhood envy and bring your neighborhood up. And so you bring yourself up by by coveting what good people have. So you don't want to play tennis with somebody that's not any good. You're never going to learn anything. So I learned subconsciously, and I think it was just my good family upbringing, uh, good envy. I, I really was, I, I never pretty much in my entire life envied, bad envied, which was uh, looking at somebody and wanting to cut them down, that that uh, I'm not going to have the nice car in my driveway, so I'm going to key their car or jab their tires. So you, you cut them down to try and destroy what you're coveting or actually destroy their happiness. So that that was my upbringing, which was just fortunate. And it's a good message um, to ponder yourself, I think. And the next thing that happened, I was very successful. I was running a spinal cord injury unit in L.A., which was one of the most prominent. Actually, in the world, I was head of the spinal, American Spinal Injury Association at the time. I published a lot. I was a full professor at USC. I, um, I'd come back from a meeting, and my fancy office, which was the best office uh, on the floor, had been moved down from the best office to kind of a cubbyhole. It wasn't even an office. And I went home and told my wife, what, just nonchalantly at dinner, what happened. And she said, uh, they've moved your cheese, you know, it's time for you to move on. I've been there 30 years and you do get old and young people come in and the young Turks want to take over and kind of move the elderly people aside. It's, it's natural, especially in American business. And I, she said, you take Fridays off, I'll take Fridays off and we'll enjoy L.A. and you can enjoy your private practice. Fortunately for her, otherwise, you know, the typical male thing would be to get in a pissing contest. I'd go back and fight, go down to the medical director's office and have a big tirade and fight. And, you know, you can't take my office and who's doing this and try and do revenge and get get even and stuff. And I went back and I brought in two great big plastic containers through all my research in it, all my papers, all my awards everything I had on the wall about the service. And I put the key on the desk and walked out. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't tell the medical director. I didn't talk to no one. I put the key on the uh, on the desk and walked out. And I called um, Australia. I was to go to Australia and uh, for a six-month sabbatical. They have six um, spinal cord injury units, and I was to spend a week at each mm -hmm. unit. And I called the people there and they said, uh, you've been tall pop. Uh, well, why aren't you coming? And I said, explained what happened. And they said, well, you've been tall poppy. 
And of course, I didn't understand that expression. And I had them repeated about 10 times. And, you know, it's kind of the way they speak and their accent. And I said, I wasn't getting and I go, you have, I don't get what's going on. You got to tell me what is, I don't get this. And, and they told me. And so that was, um, that was my introduction. So I was probably in around 60 at that time, kind of in the twilight years of my profession. And I went on and had a very successful, happy private practice, but I never got that tall poppy syndrome out of my mind. So that's the introduction, that's my career and the introduction and how it happened. And fortunately, I had my wife who had what I call very smart emotional intelligence. Uh, as I say, really the emotions are positive and negative. And the positive is, you know, to, to even take a bad situation and make it a good situation, which thanks to her we did, and not go negative. I, I mean, the trouble with most people and most emotions, as soon as we put an object in front of us, which is what anger is all about, anger is uh, an object that's getting it the way you're trying to go, um, you go negative and try and break the boulder that's in the way or something instead of figuring out how to move around it. So that happened. And none of this, none of this was in my mind because I didn't have any emotional intelligence until I retired and started doing research on the tall poppy syndrome. That's fascinating. I think, man, so a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that kind of, we could take this, but I think, especially since right now you're very passionate about the tall poppy syndrome, I'm kind of curious because I don't really know much about this. Where did that idea kind of come from? Like, what is it? I guess is the first question. And then the second question is, where, like, who came up with the idea and where did it come from? It's so fascinating. So you are, you're right. I'm passionate. I'm old. I'm 78 years old. I feel like I'm 18. I can't get enough of the tall poppy syndrome. I read the Bible. The Bible is full of the tall poppy syndrome. I just finished book a book on the Greek gods. The Greek gods are full of the tall poppy syndrome. The world's awash in the tall poppy syndrome. So the whole concept of the tall poppy syndrome is to see a field of poppies and see one field uh, where poppies, a few poppies are taller than the rest and you want to cut those poppies down. So you go out and cut them down so all of them are equal. That concept goes clear back to Herodotus, who is the Greek uh, historian, and he in this in it he describes a case of a leader not being able to govern uh, his populace, and a messenger comes in and and cuts down the at that time the head of the wheat. And at that time, he knew what he had to do was to cut down the opposition in order to be able to govern. And the next episode comes in Livy, the great Roman historian, and he actually described the poppy. So Rome, Rome was originally a kingdom. There were seven kingdoms. It was founded in 1750 B.C. and went to 500 B.C., this is really interesting. Tarquin the Proud, and the key word here is the proud, because pridefulness is the number one reason that people get cut down. The cutter feels justified in cutting somebody down. Tarquin had actually killed his father. He's a terrible person in order to become the king. And his son was ruling the adjacent town, which was Gabby, and Sextus sent a messenger back to his father to learn how to govern. And his father went out to a poppy field and he leveled all the tall poppies. The messenger went back, told Sextus what happened, and Sextus knew immediately um, what, what to do. And he, he killed all the opposing leaders. So the first emperor of China did that. Genghis Khan did that. Socrates was tall poppied. Julius Caesar was tall poppied. Every leader in the old days did that. So it was actually government cutting down the populace. And I can just tell you, if you look at what's happened in China, the premier just cut down um, the leaders 
it, the opposition leaders to him, he's now in his fifth term, which was only supposed to be two terms. So it's still prevalent in all governments and to our own. Uh, we're, our government is as bad as any government, and it's usually the what I call the three-letter departments, the FBI or, or <laughs> the IRS or Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, they're all they're all cutting people down. It's just awful once you understand this. But still on the world stage, if you look at, um, you know, Vladimir Putin is, you know, cutting down the leader of Ukraine. I mean, so this, the tall poppy vision of that story is it was a puppet. Ukraine was usually a puppet government of of Russia. And now we had a new leader who, who was popular and who was pro-democracy. And, of course, that's not going to set well with Putin. So first he has bad envy, and he's, he wants to cut that leader down because the leader wants to be pro-democracy, become a member of NATO, and become a threat. So you see that happening person to person and actually in the big scheme country cutting the other scheme down. It's almost a way of like taking like it's a great tool to if you want to get power, I guess, to use that thing to like cut. It's pretty much like cutting out your competition. Yes. I have an article uh, entitled Competition Rivalries. And remember early America, I mean, early America was dueling. Uh, I mean, when you look back and Hamilton was killed right in a duel. So du dueling is, is, is a legal form. I mean, it was legal. It was, became legal in Europe. Europe did it. Began, I mean, there's all, all these codes of, of dueling developed uh, around the 15th century. And they, they just kept being modified to each country and to each culture to include our own, our early, our early development. So dueling was very prominent and accepted in the Old West. I mean, the whole history of the Old West of crossing the Mississippi life was really about dueling. So you're cutting down the your competitor. So the easiest way to get the power is to kill the other guy, and then you have nobody to compete with, and everything is yours. So you know, whether you're competing for your girlfriend and a girlfriend, a girl or something, I mean, competition breeds um, the tall poppy syndrome, which is a good point here to make the premise. So I eventually would write a book on the tall poppy syndrome, the most cited book of almost anything. There's over 600 citations. I didn't want to I want to be apolitical. I mean, this is a political issue, although in politics are the biggest group of cutters. But the competition leads to it. And I, and I saw it when I was doing my research for the book in every country that I looked at, at every, any culture at any time, to include the Bible. And we mentioned before we started, I just finished a book on the Greek Greek gods, which are fascinating reads, and why are they fascinating? Because they're very emotion. They were very emotional gods, and the stories were so good, and we're still talking about them today. So emotional people generate strong emotional people generate strong responses, and if you don't like them, uh, which not everybody, that's another rule that your tall poppy is not my tall poppy. So Hillary Clinton may be a hero to some, but she's the enemy to to others. So uh, rule number one is your tall poppy is not mine. I want to kind of ask this. Um, so is competition, like at what point does it become bad? I guess it's kind well, of what's going through know, my That's mind why you right have now. to have emotional tell. That's the whole key. So this is all the same thing. So the premise of the book was in America, we don't know what the tall poppy syndrome is because of individualism. We're the only country in the world that theoretically worships the individual. I just came back from a two-week wonderful trip in Japan. And trust me, there's no worship of the individual in Japan. Uh, uh, the kids are all the same. They all, For us, of course, they all look the same, but uh, they go through all their education and the schools pay for them. They all wear uniforms. They all dress the same. Everything in the country is about being the same, which is not how it is here in America. So my premise was why 
the reason we must not have it was because of indiv our individualism. Well, I had uh, the first draft of the book I had to eventually tear up and throw away because as I did my research, America has is the worst. We, we cut down more people than any other country. And why is it? Number one, because we are individuals and being an individual, we've gotten confused of true individualism from self-righteousness and selfishness. And we we just cut, the government cuts down, the, the families cut down, the schools cut down. We don't have we don't have valedictorians now. We don't want a good individual. Everybody gets a trophy. You get cut down at work where I was. And, and so we're, we're destroying that concept incorrectly so as far as I'm personally concerned. But it's that competition. And the question is, how, you know, it's how do you know? And you... That that's where the tall poppy syndrome comes in, and that is where emotional intelligence comes in. So I'll tell the maybe we'll start to run out of town. So I'll tell you how, as I did my book, how this evolved and how this cuts comes in. So when we look at the behavior of the cutter, all right, the guy that's doing the cutting, generally speaking, by far and away. Day in and day out, it's bad envy. You look at somebody and they have something that you want. You make a conscious decision that you can't get that, so you try and cut them down. Anger and laziness, you just don't want to work to try and get that. Remember that we're, our country's on the dole now. We, we have this group of people, rightly or wrongly or unable, but we have a lot of people that just, and, and the COVID thing, and people are at home and getting money from the government, and now they don't even want to go back to work. So laziness is also a big driver of the tall poppy syndrome. I mean, there's a synonym called to our tall poppy syndrome, crabs in the bucket. And that concept of the crabs in the bucket, you don't need a lid on it because as you're trying to, as a crab is trying to crawl out and escape the bucket, the other crabs are calling that person down, cutting that person or pulling that person back in. And that's the way poverty is. And even the small town that I grew up in, the whole town, the concept and the Scandinavian concept and the sort of the Dutch and, and the Australians and uh, and the, all the egalitarian societies are, are sort of built on that. And in fact, the, the Scandinavians have what they call the law of Jante, J-A-N-T-E, which is there's 10 commandments of how not to grow tall. So the emotional behavior of the, are those usually those three makeups. So when you look at a situation, you just have to remember those and look at the cutter. Now the cut so that's their behavior, but there's one thing that screws everything up is the cutter uh, also through moral justice now mostly it should be righteous indignation, which is moral justification. They've broken a law, they've broken a moral law, and because they broke that, they don't deserve tall, tall poppy status. And the other th concept that's important here. Most of the cutting down by the cutter occurs within their tribe. There's, there's the people you associate, your family, your school, your workplace, your neighborhood. So I guess what? There aren't any tall poppies. So rule number two is uh, your tall poppy. One rule number one is your tall poppy is not my tall poppy. Number two is you don't have to be a tall poppy to be cut down. So the tall poppy uh, feels justified to cut down true tall poppies. So I break it down into peer-to-peer -peer or private tall poppy syndrome versus public. Now, the public tall poppy is the true tall poppy who has stature, or whether they're the best in the sport, best actor, good business person, whatever they have, they have stature. Now, their emotional behavior is very, very easy. They're the most easy to identify. And hubris or pride is the number one cause for the tall poppy, for the cutter to feel justified in cutting the tall top poppy down. At home, our expression was give a, enough person enough rope and they'll hang themselves. 
So, so that that's in the Bible is pride goeth before the fall. So the first is pridefulness. The second is greed, especially in America. And the third is lust. So that's three emotions for the tall poppy, the justification to cut them down, and the three emotions that I mentioned for the cutter's bad behavior are laziness, anger, and envy. And I've just given you seven, six of the seven deadly sins. The seven deadly sins were developed by the Pope in the fourth century, strangely enough, uh, for monks. And of course, as you wonder, well, how in Christianity, where everybody's being good, they're cloistered away, they're praying every day, why, why do they need the a lecture on the seven deadly sins? And the, that's the whole concept of the egalitarian system. Even if you're a monk and one monk has a toothbrush and the other monk doesn't have a toothbrush, that drives people crazy. You know, the little things always are what, I mean, they drive divorce. It's not the big things usually. It's just the little things keep collecting. So even monks evidently had problem in the, in the monastery. So that's, that's um, kind of the way to remember the behavior of the cutter or the kati. And that's how you can figure out and have your justification to cut somebody down or to look at yourself and maybe you've crossed the line. And uh, as you reflect on this, and I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example. So as you reflect on this, your emotional growth, the way it works is then your emotional growth works too. Just as, as we, if we take the Will Smith and Chris Rock episode at the Academy. So that's a wonderful example of the, and it's a case study of the tall poppy syndrome. There's going to be people that think Chris Rock initiated the bad behavior and Smith was justified in cutting him down. So my own personal take was Chris Rock, you know, the comedians have a script. The, you know, just like I mm -hmm. have a script and talking to yes. you, and then, then we go off script when you ask me a question or something. And so he's always looking to make it more personal uh, during the presentation to bring in, bring the story mm -hmm. home to the audience and stuff. <laughs> so he picks on people um, during that to show how alert and smart he is or whatever whatever the madness is at that particular time and and i and i thought oh, actually yeah, I it was a com is. he was comp complimenting will smith's wife because when demi moore did that i don't you're kind of young but she did that in one of the movies you know oh boy did, she was married um to uh, somebody actually who had a place in Idaho, but movie star. But anyway, it was a big deal, and she made magazine covers. But she had shaved her head and was quite attractive. So it was a, it was a kind of an acknowledgement of it. it's a strange to cut your hair, but you look dynamite in it. Not everybody can do that and get away. And Will Smith actually kind of laughed, and he knew I think what was going on. And then yeah, I didn't laugh so much. So then Will Smith. Uh, which had he had to be prideful. Only a prideful male could run up on stage, even if he didn't hit the guy, to to run up on stage in worldwide TV. So there's there's your pride, and he had anger and and he slapped him. So that's the tall poppy syndrome, and that's my take on it. But mm -hmm. in in making my own personal judgment. You have to know a little bit about the tall poppy syndrome yourself in order to justify your thoughts. So you, if you were, for example, to read my book, in the end, it's a self-help book because by reading and understand emotional makeup, emotional makeup of your neighborhood, emotional makeup of politicians, of movie stars, you have to understand them yourself. I have a saying that the... Your mind only knows, or your eye only knows, your mind only knows what the mind sees. So you have to, you know, you have to know something uh, before you make a judgment, right? You can't look at 
something and not have some preconceived idea. It's already there. You're, and so my whole idea of writing the book is try to, in medicine, you know, we can't cure the disease unless we make the diagnosis. So how are you going to know how to fix bad behavior in the tall poppy syndrome unless you understand that, know, first know the tall poppy syndrome and understand the emotional makeup. And, and in doing so, you, you yourself grow. So I have to, uh, important part of the book was the first draft was a third of the book was how to become a tall poppy. And, and then Tolstoy and Anna Karina says, um, all happy families are the same and all unhappy families are different for different reasons. And I was thinking as I was doing the how to be tall, th there's 10,000 self-help books every year. And self-help books tend to be um, inspirational, but they don't cause a lot of transfer transformation. And I never learned anything from a healthy person in my office. It's like, wh why are you here? So you, we, we in medicine only learn from disease. I mean, we learned a lot from COVID. We learned a lot from HIV. So I think in, even though the book can seem a little negative and the concept a little negative, that's really the best way to grow. And so the book in understanding the negativity that's all about us, uh, you learn how to become very positive in this negative way, which is what the seven sins, deadly sins are about. For in Christianity, the the opposite for the sin or the really the negative emotion is uh, the virtue. So kindness is people now are talking envy, but really it, it's kindness. If the um, I think you're right. I think opposite of especially bad, like how you bad talk envy about is kindness. Things like anger. So there's not a lot of kindness in America and, now, unfortunately. You know, those type of uh, the seven deadly sins. I think the best way to combat that is the opposite. Sometimes, right? Kindness, right? You mentioned that. I think that's something. I think kindness is, to your point, is something that's lacking in this country. Right? We don't take right. the time no, to actually right. listen to one another and say, oh. That's how you think, right? We're so quick to like uh, what you were mentioning earlier. We have these thoughts already in our mind like, oh, this person thinks this way. They think uh, they're going to do this. And it's like oftentimes, right, if you actually take the time to sit down and you know listen to them and hear them out, you're like, oh, I never thought of it like that. Do I agree with you? Not necessarily, but I see why you're doing this and I don't see you like you're killing it out there. Go for it type of thing and it kind of builds kindness is the way of how you build others up right and become successful as a society and i think that's kindness understanding th those two together i think and i mean that's kind of what the show is about too is trust go ahead and finish finish your go ahead and finish your thought and let me talk about trust because that's really the problem in our country no, no I, I mean the hidden the other I mean, it's basically there's not enough. As I said, if you just remember one thing from this this podcast is that there's too much bad envy in the world, and the antidote to bad envy is kindness, not empathy. We're not going around empathizing for people. That's good. That's necessary when when em empathy is indicated. But the problem is not empathy. The problem is a lack of kindness. If I try to live by this three like kind of this idea that I'm developing, it's the foundation's trust. You have to be like, people got to trust you. They got to trust you. And, uh, then there's a respect. You got to respect one another. Then there's accountability, right? You got to be accountable for one another, right? Or it just develops into anarchy. And then you got to be patient with one another. That's the last thing. And that's kind of, I think the three things built on top of trust that really, it helps you become a better person and helps those around you succeed as well. So, yeah, I kind of want to hear your thoughts on trust and kind of what you were going to take with that. So trust is hugely, trust is hugely important. I mean, the whole trust, the whole medical field is, is based on school, on trust, any, any profession, business, yes. government. So our government has no trust. First, there are 
I'll just say it. They're awful people. They just cut each other down. They cut the populace down. I mean, say, you know, deplorables and gods and guns and th things presidents say about and important politicians say about the opposition is just not right. And consequently, then we don't trust them. And then, then we have this, then, then we have COVID. And, you know, as everything became political, I, I mean, if there's one thing in medicine we, we knew was, was um, vaccines and infections, because we've been, we've known that for 100 years and been working on that and how that message has become lost. And then some of the medical people because once again it's pride they're prideful they want that government position you know it's it's getting ahead of they maybe got passed over in work or didn't get the professorship or didn't get something and here's your chance and then they get in there and then because they got nominated then they have obligations to old to the not person that nominated them and they have to take their line of thought which isn't correct and, and we lost so much trust uh, with the government over this whole COVID things because of politics. And it's just so disappointing to me. But if you look at it, if you go to Japan and stuff, they have so much trust in their own government. And the Scandinavian countries are the same way. So when you look at egalitarian countries, um, most of them have good uh, governorship and the people have elected those because they have trust in them. And, and you know, the whole social system of the government in the Scandinavian countries of giving everybody back, they have trust in their own populace that there's not going to be somebody cheat and gig the system. And we don't, have, we don't have that going either way. We don't have trust in the leaders. We feel they're going to favor the other person. And we don't have trust then, and the, and the government doesn't have trust in giving the money back that somebody's going to sham. So we're we're really lacking in trust in America, which causes a lot of cutting. And we don't have any co any concept of uh, of kindness now. I think. But here's uh, I want to introduce while we're talking, and I guess I'm trying to educate people. There's the Buddha has a very Japan has a culture based on Buddha Buddhism, uh, Shintoism, and the Confucius philosophy. And one thing I learned about uh, Buddha when I was there was he has a near, what he calls a mostly near near and far enemies, which I just love that concept. And I love that concept just on your basic friendship, for example. You know who your enemy is, you know, the guy that's throwing rocks at you. But your near enemy is actually some so-called friend of yours that's um, trying to cut you down behind your back. Right. So th the near enemy is hard to identify. And when he's talking about emotionally, uh, the is I talked about it early on, but probably nobody knew where I was going with it, the righteousness Self-righteousness is the near enemy to moral justification or what the movement groups are feeling justified in doing their actions. And the moral justification is not self-righteousness. They're, they're, they're near enemies because moral justification is morally, if we can figure out who's writing the morals these days, but there is a certain morality to life. And the near enemy to that is your self-justification, which you, your th self, which is, you just think of COVID, how many, how much uh, self-righteousness was involved in all that misinformation. And the problem right now is because of the internet, you know, there was a, what medicine called a dirty dozen. There were 12 people on the internet that were responsible for 65% of the misinformation on the internet. And the problem when those influencers do that, it makes it very difficult. And once again, this becomes with the truth and trust. Um, then it's, when they have that influence and it's the negative influence and it's just like cutting down, 
then for the positive people, the right people to rectify that is impossible. And what you were talking, and we were talking about the mind seeing or the eye seeing only what the mind knows when I was practicing. And if you came into my office with a folder of internet articles, I, I already knew that this was a lot, you were a lost case that I wasn't going to be able to help you because you have a, you through the internet have a preconceived idea of what your problem is and what your treatment was. And if there was even a, there's always, you, you know, in Iowa, we say there's, there's many ways to skin a cat. That comes from catfish. If you ever catch a catfish, they're very hard to, you, you, just, you can't descale them or anything. You have to skin it. And it's very difficult to skin a catfish. They they stay alive a long time, and they have some sharp spines, and they they'll dig into you, and it really hurts. So anyway, there's many skillful ways to medically to treat a problem, but if you come in and have a conceived way to do it, and it's not the way I do it, it's going to be very difficult for me to manage you, and there probably won't be a good outcome. So. Always, and even in the book and my own personal life, I try always to keep a very, very open mind. It's very, it's not, just give up. You're not, when it's like, try, try, I'm going to try and make you a Republican. You know, that's not, that does not, that doesn't work. Don't try and convert anybody. That, I mean, if you try and convert somebody to Christianity and work on it, that's not how it works. You know, life and, and good fortune, and you have to help things along. But happiness just happens. Don't make happiness your goal in life. Do the right things in life, and you'll be happy. A lot of people just like self-discovery, right? They kind of like to discover self for themselves, right? It's like, oh, never thought of it like that, right? And you can be that voice and like, hey, this is just, you know, and you can trust them and say, hey, like they've backed it up with credible claims, all these things. And then, yeah, I think... Especially like with advertising, I, I hate advertising if I'm being honest, but it's people are always blasting like, hey, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, right? But then I'm like, just let them like discover you on your own and then they can come up with their own thoughts. And I mean, that's kind of the trouble with the internet, right? I think that you were talking about is that it's there's kind of like a wall, right? So like someone else thinks, oh, they're trying to convert me, whereas maybe some people are like, oh, I'm just speaking my mind and this is from my experience, this is what I know to be true type of thing. And I think that's what people try to do. So I'm going to use, this is kind of a question I'm going to use to wrap up. I think for one, accountability is very important, right? So maybe, right, we have like certain things we should and shouldn't do type of thing, right? And especially in those countries you mentioned, there are people that break those rules. How I'm going to use this as the intelligent question of the day. How do you kind of establish that accountability system so then, you know, people can still pursue happiness, right? That's in our, I think, declaration of independence and, but still be able to have like society that's not like going all over the place and like almost anarchy or, I, I don't know, tyranny, one of those no, it's trust. It's trust in your parents. It's trust in your school system. It's trust in your boss at work. It's trust in the mission, um, the mission of the company that you're working for. Uh, uh, in the end, it's it's mostly trust. And once that's broken down, I mean, if you're mad at your parents and you don't trust them, if you're, you know, it's, it's like, do as I say, not as I do. If your dad's telling you not to drink and he's a drunk or, you know, he's telling you to not have loose morals and he's running around with other women. So you automatically lose trust. That's what the ACE is all about. So, and so if you lose trust trust early on uh, in your family, I mean, that that's a problem. If you lose trust in, in your school system, uh, I, I mean, I, it was because of my Catholicism, I, I went to private schools. So it was a lot of like-mindedness, um, but that like-mindedness was sort of based on good moral values. So I'll say that's justified, but uh, I had a good moral base for everything. And, you know, I trusted my teachers and I actually went to uh, Jesuit undergraduate school and medical school as well. So I was 
I had good habits and good trust of people and what was happening. But, men, you know, for all people, and it's just not mentorship. I, I mentioned I, I was just really lucky in my life. I had really good people always directing me. I, I mean, even, you know, usually I have co- you have competition to get your residencies and to get jobs and stuff. And I was fortunate uh, that I had people seeking me out. It was almost like the priest telling me what I needed to do. I had, I had people helping. I think, you know, if you're kind and you're not aggressive and you're doing the right thing, if you're studying hard and you show up on time and you dress appropriately, whatever that is, if you're doing all the right things, really good things happen to you. People notice that and they help you along. And just, just like, you know, the, person that brings in the internet information then the right thing to be is to look at them be interested in it be kind and generous to the person and say look you know i tried that thing that you want me to do to you but i've i've personally found you know that that hasn't worked very well at least in my hands and what i found works is this and not get prideful, which is what most physicians would do. We were prideful by by our very nature because we 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 have to compete to get into college and to medical school and residency and internship and our practice and stuff. And so we have we have an internal pride of what we've accomplished, and unfortunately. The negative side of that, the hubris, you know, he gets turned on very easily. So, you know, we get offended by somebody coming in and questioning. And that's the way the government is now. We can't even question the government or anybody. As soon as you do that, you go to the Internet to get your do- uh, daily dose of confirmation bias and find other people that are going to support you. So if you left my office and I wanted to do something else and you and you weren't happy with my MO, you would run back to the Internet and try and get some confirmation bias and maybe look for a different orthopedic surgeon that did the thing that you wanted him to do, which in the end probably wasn't the right thing because most of the Internet is misinformation. There's a lot of misinformation. I think there's more information, misinformation than there is true knowledge on the Internet, and there's certainly no wisdom on the Internet. You have to earn wisdom. I mean, be nice. I, I mean, the whole world. I mean, for example, you know, I have the nicest uh, post office pers- po- um, post person in the world. She uh, brings uh, boxes to our door so she, she doesn't dr- and knocks on the door so that we'll pick them up and nobody will steal them. She's made us, I like key lime pie, how she ever figured that out. It's beyond me, but anyway, she's made made us a key lime pie. So, how can how can you ever have a postman do do those nice things? So, that I I mean, no no matter what you're doing in society, if you're kind, of, and I actually have a a chapter in my book devoted to it. I call it servitude. And if you're just serving your fellow man, no matter. Mm-hmm what job you're in, you're going to be hugely successful. And and actually that became my, my means to enter tall, tall poppyhood is uh, servitude, which, which is the end is kindness. If you're just kind to your brothers and sisters and your parents and your schoolmates and your workmates and, you know, people that you come in contact, I have to tell you, you'll be very, very, very successful and that's just the opposite of bad envy, which I had mentioned. If there's nothing else to take from this podcast is look look, look out for bad envy and don't be a bad envy dealer. Merchant of bad envy gets you cut down every time. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the title of the book's the tall poppy phenomenon, right? Syndrome. Ah, it's close. Syndrome. Tall, the tall poppy syndrome. Huh. Yeah, well, it's it's a medical psych, psychological thing, but it's just not a disease. It is a disease, but it's not what we consider the typical disease. And actually, I, the first 
part of the book is a glossary of all the terms I'm going to use because it is semi-technical. And then I go through the syndrome and what the syndrome means in medicine, what a syndrome is and stuff. So you do have the cutter. You have to have a cutter and you have to have somebody cut down. So I go, what what actually the terminology I'm being, that's why there's so many citations. But you have that, and actually, uh, since I like to teach, and you might have five minutes left. The final part, which is also very part, so and the subtitle of the book is The Joy of Cutting Others Down. That term is actually schadenfreude. And have you heard of that? That's kind of a fun. That if you say that at your next beer party or cocktail party, you'll be the toast of the party because schadenfreude is a German word. Uh, not all languages can make up words like English, we can in America. So the, if they have a new thing, then they usually just take uh, old words and add another word to it, or sometimes three words to make a new meaning. So schadenfreude is two words, harm and joy. And schadenfreude is uh, having joy from somebody else's harm. So the last component of the tall poppy syndrome is actually schadenfreude, which is taking joy when the other person is cut down. So, for example, if your neighbor had a fancy car and you just cut his tires, that that's not so much fun in and of itself. That was a nice prank. But, you know, you're not going to your self-esteem might not be elevated. But what the cutter would do would be sitting sitting, sitting, literally waiting for the neighbor to come out and have his binoculars on and see, see him come out and find that his wheels, his tires have been cut. So it's that actual experience of destroying the other people's happiness. So that's schadenfreude. And that's really negative, negative, negative um, envy. But that's what the joy of cutting somebody else does. There's a term for that. As I said, there's a term for everything, for schadenfreude, for the tall poppy syndrome in other countries. And we just don't have that. So that's the concept of the tall poppy syndrome is to hope one or two people read the book and and figure out. I'm telling you, look at the world completely different if you understand the tall poppy syndrome and the behaviors of the cutter and the cuttee and uh, you'll you'll yourself will become a much better person and you can find everything naturally on the internet on doug garland d-o-u-g-g-a-r-l-a-n-d dot com and then that's my web page and then you can book comes up naturally the first front and center but i actually just hit it and um, and read the reviews. There's some really, really good reviews. It's fortunately, fortunately, but somehow um, smart people have drifted towards the book, and you can tell you can tell the intelligence of the reader by the type of reviews they write. So, so there's some really good reviews. Read those, and that may may if the podcast doesn't talk you into reading, it's not a easy read. You're not going to read it on the airplane. Just sit at home in some private time and some think time. And you'll grow as a person. I learned a lot more about the tall poppy syndrome, not phenomenon. And, oh, yeah, and about myself and, like, yeah, and some of the things that, you know, maybe I could change and some of the things that maybe I'm already doing good and, you know, kind of a direction I can take that. So a final thing, just like the bully, you know, you bullying, tall poppy syndrome is usually cutting down somebody higher. Uh, and that's how you, instead of uh, emulating them, you cut them down to your level. Bullying is actually the reverse. It's power and it's cutting down. It's kind of the near enemy. It's cutting down uh, somebody lower and it's a power over them, whether it's physically, mentally, socially, financially, uh, whatever it is, but you know, if the, if you're successful as that in your family very early on, and then you do that in school, and that becomes your behavior, ingrained behavior, and and that's made you successful. I mean, you're going to continue it in your your um, pro- professional life, whatever it is. If you're not called out, you're never going to 
uh, understand your own behavior. So the self-help books really should do that, but they don't. That's why I actually like this negative concept of shaking you and realizing that. But if you do see the cutting down, you need to you need to understand the concept. But as a, as we discussed, it's important to not call them all, but just suggest it. You know, you just say, you know, you know, really. I'm not sure that was the right behavior. It seems to me maybe you were bullying that person or something. And the, and the instead of confronting them, just I mean, I had to. Most of my practice was suggesting treatment, not recommending treatment. And that way, that way, the other person gets to think about it. I'm not forcing anything on them, but it, it uh, gives them something internal power. So when you see bad behavior, you can't just call it out. You just get, you just cut that person down. You go, geez, what was that all about? You know, what were you thinking? And, you know, you can kind of segue into your new emotional intelligence and help that person grow. But you won't do it just like converting somebody's politics or religion. You have to be kind and gentle and and have your own you have to have your own emotional intelligence so you're not going to help somebody. That's why this book is good. You'll grow. You're, in the 90s, we did have emotional intelligence. There was a small, short-lived movement. What was more important than IQ intelligence or in emotional intelligence? I'm big on emotional intelligence. Awesome. Well, you can. Doug, thank you for coming on today. I've enjoyed learning from you, and I'm sure the viewers and listeners have also enjoyed learning from you as well. So thank you for taking the time to come on today. My pleasure. Happy to be with you. Have a good day. You as well. So everyone, as you can tell, that is Douglas Garland. As you can tell, he's a very intelligent person, has great things to say. He dropped his info there. If you guys found anything interesting today, I challenge you guys to go listen to that and to go uh, explore Doug a little more. Stay tuned till next week. We have a great guest lined up for you guys. See you guys next week, and let's get after it. Hey, everyone. If you liked this episode and would like to hear more, be sure to hit that subscribe or follow button. We release a new episode every Wednesday for you guys to listen to. Thank you guys so much for the support that you give. We could not have done this without you guys. If you would like to be a potential guest on the show, check out intelligentconvos.com and fill out the form there. Thank you guys again, and let's get after it.